Good. All right, it is nine o'clock, and uh, this is the Board of County Commissioners of Rio Blanco County, Colorado, September 14th, 2021. We're at the Rio Blanco County Historic Courthouse, 555 Main Street, third floor, Meeker, Colorado, 81641. This meeting will be live streamed on the Rio Blanco County YouTube channel. <clears throat> this is a work session. Work sessions are intended to provide opportunities for the commissioners to study difficult issues, gather and analyze information, clarify problems, or give staff direction. No official decisions will be made. Work sessions are on a floating docket. The schedule is provided for informational purposes only. Sessions will normally be considered in the order in which they appear on this schedule. However, all times are approximate and may begin at the commissioner's discretion. Additionally, the board may alter the schedule, take breaks during the meeting, or continue an item for further work session date. All right, first item up is uh, public health. Alice Harvey with an update. So do you want to go ahead? Yeah, and just to remind myself, I don't have to speak into this anymore, nope. right? Okay, nope. great. Um, so since we have Board of Health scheduled for next Tuesday, I was hoping I could sort of skip the COVID update and just do non-COVID updates um, for all of you because I have a few things um, versus going into the details of COVID. Is that okay since we have that scheduled for next Tuesday? Okay, um, so the first thing I'll just say, um, it would be my recommendation that we at least, uh, we've already offered it to be virtual, so I have the Google link. But I definitely want to recommend that um, anyone who is high risk or who just everybody understand that virtual attendance be recommended because of the high case rates right now in Rangeley. And I know that up there we have a smaller space as well physically um, in that boardroom. So that would just be my recommendation for everyone, um, especially if you're concerned with uh, health. I want to make sure that's clear to everyone. Uh, but I'd leave it with the board as far as, you know, that decision to continue to host it in person. Um, but I'll have the Google Meet option. So as long as we can make, I'm sure we can make it work like we normally do. I've just put on the message. It can confuse some people. Um, they have to call in the number if they'd like to speak. They can't speak right. through the Google Meet because we have to mute it so it doesn't give us the feedback. So just a heads up for everybody on that. Um, and then I wanted to let you all know too, uh, we are moving ahead our, with our IGA for family planning with Rangeley District Hospital. We were, we're very, very um, grateful. They have, uh, Kyle Wren uh, reached out to me a couple weeks ago, said they do have a provider who's uh, ready to start providing that service again over there in office. So we're just resuming what we were doing before. Um, and then we did clean up the IGA a little bit to reflect the updates we'd included on the PMC IGA that is still pending. So that way they're matching. Um, so that's, Great news, it means that we're in compliance with the grant and they'll be able to start um, sending that provider down. Any questions about that at all? Or I think everything, Don, you were mm -hmm. okay with that IGA and everything yeah, too. Yeah, IGA All right, um, so if there's no questions with that, um, I did finally after, actually Julie Drake had started the conversation with a company called Baxcare several years ago to get billing um, on board for our flu vaccines. We've never been able to actually recapture that cost um, of the flu vaccines. What we've done in the past was charge people cash and then give them a receipt that they could submit to their insurance company for reimbursement. That was very cumbersome for people, definitely not very popular. Um, last year, of course, we ended up getting that big bulk of free flu vaccine from the state. So we weren't charging that last year. Um, but this year, now we're back to our private stock. And so I've... Um, as long as um, you don't have any concerns with it, I've talked to that company and they'll be able to, the way it works is they, in future years, what they will do is purchase the flu vaccine. They ship it to us. We have no upfront cost. And then they do the billing for all insurances. And then we actually get reimbursed the administration fee. So it'll actually be revenue for us instead of it being a, um, a loss, which it has always been because we just pay out of pocket for those flu vaccine every year. This year, they can actually start now um, the way they'll do it. We pre-book flu, so we already purchased our flu vaccine for this year. So the way that will work is they will buy, buy back any that we give, and, and so we can start it this year. So this year, we won't see um, as much, but by next year, we could potentially start seeing some revenue for the vaccines, which, of course, will <clears throat> just simply be from billing, being able to build it in insurance companies that people have, um, and they'll take the top 
they take all the top payers here in the county. They check that for us as well. So I wanted to update you all on that. Um, it will also allow us to be able to offer a few more vaccines to people like shingles in very high demand. Um, we don't want to take any business away from our clinics, medical clinics here. Um, but even in talking to our clinics, that is something that they know that, you know, that's not necessarily a profitable thing for them to be able to provide to anyone. Um, so we're, we could do that with this company too, and it wouldn't cost us anything. There's no way we can do that without this sort of middle ground, um, this middle company because of the fact that it costs so much. I mean, we're talking thousands to purchase it up front. Um, so we would lose money if we provided that privately. So it's really the only way I'd be able to provide those vaccines privately that people. These flu vaccines, what do they typically cost? Um, per shot, um, it's around $25 a shot. Um, so we spend about 10000 a year, and we have historically for quite some time. Um, we got, it got, last year, we doubled the number of flu doses we gave when we did the drive throughs It was really convenient for people, and they really liked that. So um, this seemed to be the only solution for us to be able to keep doing it, but also be able to capture back. Last year, we had that awesome. lot of no charge. Back. Right. It was free from the state. And it's like still the shingles. How expensive are those? Oh, they're really expensive. That's like six hundred bucks a shot. So, like you know, there's no way we could justify using you know county dollars to buy those and then give it to someone. We'd only capture so much back on the insurance, and it takes a great deal to just bill. In and of itself, we've tried to do it ourselves, but it's like you need a whole expert biller to be able to do medical billing, and it's too much. I think as far as would be cost effective to do it internally. So I'm hoping that'll be helpful. Can I interrupt you one second? Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't, Commissioner Rector, are you on the phone? Yeah, I was just checking. I thought he would be, so. All right, well, we'll move on. I just was curious. Yeah, any questions about that? I just want to make sure you guys knew I was going to move ahead with that. Are you planning on doing the drive-through flu? Yes. Yeah, we're going to start the end of September because we actually have our flu shots in earlier this year. So we'll be able to start that late September. Will we have this billing system in place? We should, yes. Yeah, if it's okay with you, I haven't, you know, kind of checked the final box yet, but there is no upfront cost and there's no contract associated with it. Um, so I, what I was going to do is ask you guys today, if, it, if you think it sounds like a good idea, I would just forward kind of the information about what, what's entailed to Janae and to Don, just to make sure it looks good. Um, and then I think it's only a couple of weeks to get it going in live, so. Yeah, just get it to Dawn would be my thoughts and make sure there's not something there that we don't expect. Right. Yeah, I I just, yeah. okay. I'll ask him for something. It said it's not a contract, but I'm sure there's some kind of agreement that you know they can send that summarizes the service. But how are they doing this? They must be getting a fee. This is a private? So they bill the insurance the and they get the money back for the doses. Right. So then we're not paying. And then if we don't use the dose, they actually take it back and it's no cost to us. That's another. I'm wondering how they are justifying. How are they justifying doing this? I imagine they have enough volume that they're, they're yeah. you know, for every, all of the contracts. Where are their revenues come yeah, yeah. They, And they bill the insurance back. So they get the co on the insurance. Right. One, insurance pays. So like I go in. And I'll give them my car, and they will uh, uh, bill my insurance company. And they do that. They've negotiated a better deal. Well, I, I asked them straight up that question. I said, "So what's in it for you? What's the catch? Yeah. <laughs> How does this work?" Yeah. They said they make their profit with the vaccine and billing, and we get the administration fee, which is just the fee that we can bill insurance for the nurse to give the shot, which of course we've never done before. Um, is about fifteen to twenty-five dollars, depending on the insurance. So we. That's what we get. They keep everything else, essentially. And they do enough of it that that makes them a profit. So yeah. They're pretty automated, I think. They're reputable. They're the, they're the leading company in the nation that does it, so. I don't see an issue with it, do you? No. Okay. That's a good idea. And something to you both. Um, Okay, and then summer events, just wanted to let you guys know those all three were a big success. So I'm so glad that it's they're over because, <laughs> I mean, you know, it was great. It was wonderful to be out in the community. We had a uh, range call, of course, September Fest, and then sheepdog trials. So we were out there, um, had some good presence with the community and, and, you know, brought all of our information and 
So that was all three went very well. Um, the vendors all seem to be the event sponsors seem to be happy with that service we provided. Um, so those are completed now. Um, so that was, uh, that was a great thing. And thank you for letting, yeah, I think that was a great collaboration to be able to, to do that, you know, and, and support the community as well as, you know, good use of that grant funding. Um, and then finally, um, uh, unfortunately, Holly Knowles has put in her resignation um, as of yesterday for our environmental uh, food. She's our environmental um, retail food inspection um, specialist with the public health. She's been with us for quite some time. Um, and so she, her position is 24 hours a week. Um, we're looking internally at that program and we're going to need to have some more in-depth conversations about that. Um, her role has really changed quite a bit over the past year with COVID. So I actually budgeted for a third of her time. Um, our, our amount for doing the retail food inspection, that grant funding decreased this year, but she was actually spending real time about a third of her time helping with, you know, COVID stuff. Um, so we were, I actually budgeted to put a third of her time towards the grant in the next year, um, towards the COVID grant. So that had already shifted, but with her leaving, we'll have to look at the program itself. It's a very training intensive role. So it takes three to six months to get somebody trained. Um, somebody would need, need that kind of uh, science background to be able to do it. It's pretty intensive. Um, she's been doing it for quite some time. Moffitt County, other counties, um, you know, it's a program we could t we could give up, but I don't know that that would be what's best for our community. It's a service people really like having local. Um, I've definitely tried to get some feedback from other counties that let the state do that piece, and it's not as well taken at all in the community when you have state inspectors coming in versus local. And of course, Holly has done a phenomenal job working with our businesses. I mean, she she's got that relationship with all of our retail food establishments and. So it'll be, uh, we, we are very thankful for her service. It's a big um, loss for us, but we'll have to talk a little more about how we might, how will we will work that uh, program with her being gone. Well, did you say Moffitt is state? They are state, and they have been for a very long time, forever. Um, so, you know, the, we, we, we can look at the, what that would mean. I don't know if maybe sending, we could even do some kind of a survey if you'd want me to out in the community to see what our local businesses or how they feel about about that it doesn't bring in a lot of money I I think so I was that one guy wait yeah Jeff or Jeremy yeah yeah he he wasn't just doing the food service he was doing yeah more environmental yeah what does Garco do you know I think Garco is local. They do it locally. They do it with the county. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm almost positive. Um, so we can talk about that. I have got an email out to the that group of people to let them know Holly's leaving. Um, they'll be able, I'm, I'm sure they'll be able to support us in the meantime. We get about 18000 a year from retail food licensure and we get about 10000 for the grant. So it covers about 75% of her, her salary and um, so we'll see. We're, we're definitely at capacity. It's very stretched right now. We're providing a roughly, I wanted to let you know the last update I have, um, about 130 tests on average weekly now countywide um, to people, uh, 50 to 100 phone calls per day. So we are absolutely stretched to the max. Um, but we, um, so that's another option, you know, potentially looking at someone who could do some of those administrative duties, which is what Holly's been doing to support us in addition to the retail food, similar to what I was budgeted for this, budgeting for this next year. So, I mean, there's lots of things we can talk about. How that be, would have to up the hours for that position. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, she's 24, so, you know, that would be... Are about a third of the time dealing with COVID. Right. Um, a food service oh, piece of it. Uh, it's not a third additional. No, okay. Right. So we can either do it like we have been doing it, hire somebody to do it, see exactly what Holly's doing, or we could restructure that. Right, restructuring like looking at someone who's already so in the we, department taking on. Yeah, so we'll probably need that information on your thoughts as soon as possible. Yeah. to know how to advertise for that. Hopefully, I'll uh, look at. It appears to be working. Right yeah. yeah. When when we have some part time employees currently, you know, we have Jada who's thirty hours a week. We've got um, Mary who's twenty four. So so looking best thirty two. You know, we 
So I want to look at that too, and who we already have, and what, how you know what the what the duties are, how we can shift them around. We'll see, but maybe yeah. it might just be a straight replacement. Though. Gotta look at that because when we jump from that, where's that jumping point where they be, where they start getting the full benefit package? Because that really increases the cost. So at twenty four, that was the thing with Holly is at twenty four, yeah. you have to offer it to them, and then yeah. we pay eighty percent of it. But she wasn't Absolutely. taking she wasn't taking it. So once again, that you know, if we replace it with somebody who would like that at 24 hours, but you can then assume that's it. the case. But it's so 30, 30 hours. 30, 30 hours. 30 is full. Yeah. 30 is 100. Okay. percent That does factor in the. If it's somebody that's already on it and yet, and they're already getting 80, going to 100 is not that big a deal. But if it's a whole new deal. Right. We'll just have to look at them. Yeah, we'll look at them. you got to assume they're going to want the benefits when you advertise the job. Yes. Sometimes, yep. Yep. Yeah, so that's really all I have. Just one last thing, though, as far as capacity goes. We did, remember last time I told you all that the uh, CDPHE would be willing to jump in and help with surge capacity for case investigation? Well, that is not entirely true. They are at capacity now. So they were not able to help us last week. They took, I think, five cases. And out of our hundreds that we had, you know, assigned across the last couple of weeks. So that's also been a big stretch on staff. And so we're, we're, we're hoping we can continue to provide all the services that people are needing right now. But we're, we're hanging in there. So, so you're, you're comfortable with the amount of staff that you have right now? No, I'm absolutely not. It's not more. <laughs> no, I would absolutely, I, I need a whole other person, you know, administrative help, but I've already, we just added Michelle as another contact tracer. She's going to help with some of the data entry. She's still training. Of course, Jada and Karen are still training. Um, so, so once they get caught, we'll see. will you, you think you'll be all right? No, I mean, I can't say that I I don't need more help that I can't. I mean, I worked like 90 hours last pay period just to keep up. Like, it's it's tough. But that with that being said, I'm fully aware of our budget situation. I'm not coming to you today asking for additional staff. But with Holly leaving, you know, that's also, of course, a huge issue. So we need to address that first. And we need to figure out how we're going to work that. But the other thing, though, I mean, we have to remember that we do have funds to right. be able to help offset that with additional immunization okay. and yeah. ELC funds. So, you know, just depending on how we budget it and how we allocate it, right. we can definitely offset, you know, if it is Those a part of a cost. We very can legitimate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Depending on what we're doing and how we right. set up the position. So the poly position went to a full-time 40 hours, 30, 40 hours. That would help with your... Right. Definitely. And but and we can make up that difference with the COVID funding, right? Yes, as long as the you know any of the retail food inspection stuff, obviously you couldn't bill under yeah. that. But right. anything related to ELC or immunization that are allowable expenses, let's just push it over there. Yeah. We have the money. and I would have that funding. Right. Yes. It and would so just have to be have temporary. To be advertised as a temporary that portion of. That's the key. Is you would have to make sure people understood that that wouldn't be permanent when I that funding know. ran out. It would be. 2024 now, but it, you know they're all different. So I, I mean, it's, but yeah, once it ran out, it would have to drop back down to the 24. Contrary to what our governor says, it's not free money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said that on the news. Oh, <laughs> but that's all I have for you today, though. Um, we'll see you next Tuesday, and strangely, right. thank you. All right, moving on, uh, facilities is next on our work session sheet with Eric for an update. Um, I know, you're good. We, we discussed. Not that I... Thank you. So I'll uh, be updating on the airport outfall project, the water line expansion for the airport, and then an issue that arrives for the taxiway at the Rangeley Airport. Um, so starting off, um, 
on the Meeker Airport outfall project, the original contract dates was we did the bid opening on June 29th. The bid award was on July 13th, and we had planned to execute contract on July 23rd. The construction time period was 110 consecutive calendar days, which would mean the contractor needed to finish by November 11th. Um, and then we had liquidated damages within the contract of $800 per day after that. Um, currently, what we did was we awarded the contract to TDA Construction. They We executed the contract on July 23rd. They um, submitted their uh, submittals for the precast um, product, so that's the inlets, the flare boxes, and the reinforced concrete pipe on July uh, July 30th. I'm sorry, July 28th, and then we approved those submittals on July, uh, July 30th. At that point, Forterra, who is the precaster, gave us a 12 to 13 week lead time um, at that date. Um, at that point, I discussed it with Travis. Um, the owner of TDA Construction, that that potentially would definitely imp or not potentially um, that that would impact the construction schedule for this project. Um, at that time, we were not entirely certain. Is it going to be? Is there some conservative nature on that from Forterra? And as the weeks have passed, it they're holding true to that schedule. So on September eighth, I received another email from Forterra that said they were still five to six weeks out on the on the structures. And then they have about a three week fabrication time and then about a one week um, cure time before they're able to ship those and get those products on site. So essentially with, if we were to use the precast structures, the, the contractor TDA could not meet the original contract date of the, of the project. Um, I spoke with Travis about options to bring that schedule in and meet it for this fall. Uh, the two options basically, and I agree with them being the, the single two options is he either does cast in place on these structures or he sets up his own precast operations in his yard. Uh, my concern with cast in place is one is given the, the weather and how long we'd have to keep the excavations open along with how we would have to support and third party testing and inspections on, on those structures with doing mixed design. Um, I saw that as bringing up some quality control risks, uh, creating some issues with site accessibility for the homeowners in that area. And then also there'd be a, a question of vulnerability for the project given whether, you know, he'd have an open pit with half framed up walls and then we get the, we get the excavation flooded out. The side with him setting up his own precast operation brings in a lot of issues with quality control and quality assurance. Um, given the fact that he doesn't have a precast operation, he doesn't have a quality assurance, quality control pro program set up, it'd be really difficult for us to ensure that the structures that were being precasted in his yard would, would meet our specifications for, for the project. So that's, that's the side on, on scheduling issues on this project. Um, the other side of that is the waterline expansion. Now, during my previous discussions, we looked at planning the waterline expansion concurrently with the stormwater improvement. So one excavation, one big hole, why that is excavated out, we get in, we replace the water, we do the expansion from six inch to 10 inch, we get that work done and concurrently with Stormline, um, that looked to me as being the most advantageous for the county on cost dollars. And given the fact that the contractor, uh, it would be ease, we're not having to have contractor A working with contractor B and, and then they could do all the work together. I'd done a rough estimate and, and my estimate missed a, a number of things that ended up showing up in the design. My estimate basically came in and said, okay, we're adding two 10 inch valves and we're replacing this 273 feet of, of water line. Um, after getting the design done from Mountain Cross Engineering, um, they're requiring thrust blocks at the 45 degree angles. 
Uh, we also on site during that um, review, we identified that basically we don't know where three of the water supply is for the, the homeowners up there on the, the eastern side of the project. And that, you know, the design to essentially cover, hey, look, if we don't if we don't find these lines, we take them all the way back to the meter vaults that we know are in location. And that design, that was not in my, my design. So I, I submitted these design documents to TDA Construction for them to provide us a, a, a um, change order pricing and estimate. That change order pricing and that estimate came in at $112,000. I included that in these documents. Uh, it's actually one hundred twelve thousand eight hundred dollars. Um, I immediately sent back a response because in the estimate uh, we don't have material breakout. Um, there's a significant line item for mob and bonding. There's a significant item item for surveying. Um, in my practices, that would I would assume that that would be covered under prime contract. We have surveying work done. The fact that he has the uh, the design documents prior to starting construction would mean that he wouldn't have to remove the design uh, the surveyor they would allow them to do the survey staking um, and and so that that did surprise me if those line items were in um, Travis did provide a response to my questions on on the uh, the detailed cost takeoffs which I industry standard they typically contractor provides those that way we can calculate that during pay time, and then we can also utilize that for backup of the change order. His response is included in this packet. Um, he was vague on his responses with just given the explanation that, you know, with the MOB and bonding, he would have to increase his bonding because this would increase the project, um, which is not arguable, It's but it would be based on a percentage that the MOB would require him to mobilize in some box culverts uh, or for her, some shoring for the excavation and a few other items, but he, he did not provide any material invoice uh, in material estimation for, for that. So we could see that, that breakout. So that, that basically gets us to the update. And so as I see it, we have, this is a really good uh, point to exercise some options that I see is available for us. Um, of course, the way the project's designed, we don't have to do the water line improvement. It just makes things a lot easier and makes sure that we don't have to do that work again. So we can simply say TDA construction, your completion date needs to be based on the prime contract duration, and you need to get that work done as contracted. And, and we, don't, we don't touch the water line and they go and they get the work done. And if they fail to do that, we exercise our right for liquidated damages. That's, in my view, a very harsh um, direction, and and I don't think that 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 would greatly benefit, you know, either party. It's just it's one option. Another option would be to say, okay, we issue a a no cost change order. We understand that given COVID and and the current state of things, that we're seeing a lot of issues with procurement. And so we make an agreement that says, okay, we're going to in extend your contract into 2022. However, we would like to see all the materials that is needed for this project uh, on site, and we can store it at our Abbott property that is adjacent to the project by the end of the year. That way we know with certainty that we have everything that's ready to go. And so, so as soon as the water, as soon as the weather allows us and it breaks and it uh, it makes sense. We can begin start and get this done as efficiently as possible. This option would then also allow us to send the water line improvement project out to a formal bid. And that way we can better review the cost of that work and it would be a much more competitively priced option for us. And then that would allow us to then have that water line work done prior to the storm line system done. And then we still would have that work done and then the Stormline system would follow. Question, Eric. Yes, sir. I was following you right up until you talked about the waterline improvement project. Are you talking something different than the 200 and 
some feet, or are you saying that that's the waterline improvement? That would be, in this context, the waterline improvement. That was not part of Travis's original data. It is, yeah, it is not. The waterline improvement, we didn't have the the design done in the direction prior to bidding the storm line. The other question I have is, what is to prevent us from just going in, and I don't know where the trenches have to be for the storm drainage project exactly, but why are we having to worry about where the residents are hooking in uh, if we're just replacing 200 and some foot and upgrading it to 10 inch? The residents tap in into that section of 273 feet. There is. Yeah, we we don't quite know where they're at. There's an assumption that they're... I think all of them are in that 270 feet. The three of them are, are definitely... Uh, the fourth one, which is Mike Hoke's property, we believe taps into the cross section. And so it, it's, it's not in that area. Yeah, it's in direct line of the, the line going up. But Wouldn't the, that be a good thing then? If they're in that, the three of them, I should say. The fact that we know that we'll, we'll be tapping them in in this new line, just with a saddle and a valve, right? It would be a good thing to well, then we know where they are. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we, we definitely talked about that. There is an option um, because, you know, what we what we don't want to do is we don't want to cut the water off to their properties for an extended amount of time. And so what we talked about doing was coming in and and tapping into the line further down from the cross section and then tapping them in and, and running their lines. And then they're they're completely taken care of and they're done. Creating them a new saddle off our line. Correct. And then what would be nice is then you would come in and place in the new valve past that, and then we wouldn't have to chlorinate that line, and we, would, we wouldn't have to disrupt their water for, for more time than what it takes just to drop in a new valve. And then we'd be able to isolate them off of the rest of the line to the airport, and, and it would be a, it'd be a nice fix. To uh, to do that, you know, that would be definitely a good option where we we could do that essentially now. We could say, hey, contractor, uh, go in, tap these three lines further down, run them out to their their meter pits, and and get them to, get them all tied in, and and then they're done and and good to go. And then we don't. That's one less thing we have to worry about during the storm stormwater project or doing the expansion to the water line. So is the existing ten inch is it ductile? Or is yes. It, yes, sir. There's uh, about 300 feet from the highway up the access road that is 10 inch ductile iron, and it's we've exposed the end of it. And it looks it looks like it's in really good shape. Um, that it's all very usable. Um, we shouldn't have any issues with it. The real issue is the fact that three of those residences are in this section will be replaced. Yeah. The, yeah. There's uh the the three residents their supply line and then for whatever reason the fur the property furthest east their meter their meter vault is on the west side of the water line uh, on the the west side of supply so their their system their water line comes off of somewhere it comes off of our our main line up to the airport it goes to the west to their their meter pit and then it then heads east all the way to the furthest address to the to the east and and that's why in the the design we we show moving that meter pit all the way to the east because then it, it another one of those things moving one more thing out of our out of our projects uh, boundary to kind of clean everything up so that it, it makes sense on where all the locations are and so we we address that in the drawings. It's more than just replacing 300 or 200 and some feet. Yes, sir. It's 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 cleaning it up. It's cleaning the the spaghetti that that's crossing. Um, so there there is a lot of again we have a very small project with a lot of complicated elements to it, um, and then you you compound that with some of the issues we're having with procurement with, and that's that's kind of where we're at. And, and so, there, like I said, the 
the second option of saying, well, well, why don't we wait till spring to do the stormwater line? It buys us of a little bit of time to figure out who we want to contract with the water. Do we want to accept this change order with TDA? Do we want to send it out to bid and then kind of treat this as a separate aspect to the to the project? Um, no one option that I see is is going to be really clean and perfect just because you know, where you're going to have so many different coordinations and, and points of contact. We are currently under contract with TDA. For the stormwater project. Yes. And and the pre cast structures are the driving on the schedule. That's what yeah. need the extension on the completion date. Correct. Which, with what's going on, we all know that procurement is a huge issue on many things. So that's not a surprise. Um, I don't think it's any fault of theirs. No, so I don't we, either. I don't think that we can I don't really think ding them for that. For us to try and get out of the contract with them because of that, I don't think is a legitimate reason to do that. I, I'm of the contract amendment too. That's an amendment changing the date. Yeah. I would tend to lean toward let's get the stormwater done like we'd originally intended. That's been put off for years now. And let's get it done. And clearly that change in that two hundred some foot of pipe out is more involved there than what at least I originally thought. As far as you know, I, I don't know that it should be that big a deal for those three residents once that's in there to go back in and tap into that. You know what you got there at that point yeah. at any time in the future. Is it going to be cheaper to to wait and do the water and the stormwater simultaneously? Sure. sure. Um, the, um, the way I looked at it was the answer was was yes having the contractor do both projects means they're they're coordinating with themselves right so they they come in and and they do that excavation and and they're doing the work concurrently and then they know exactly where everything is going and then they can then sequence the work so that if if they need a section of this pipe placed in because that makes sense along concurrently with the water line they can do it all in one and, and backfill. Um, I feel, and then given the limited amount of information that was given with the change, the change or with PDA construction, um, it's my perception that it, it feels like it's being bid as, as two different projects. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing the same line items, you know, and where I would kind of see, in my opinion, and it's just, it's whatever that's for, um, you know, you get a benefit by them not having to go to formal bid process. And so part of that is saying, okay, well, you know, survey work, I can coordinate my survey work. And so I don't necessarily need to tack that on here. Um, I, you know, in this section, I'm going to have one excavation hole and I'll be able to do the backfill all in one shot and, um, and do that. And so I'm going to, I'm going to give them a savings on that side by not having to, deal with another contractor coming in and messing this stuff up. Um, this seems this seems high. However, without having any any comparison other than the single change order, it's really difficult for me to evaluate that. And then it is also difficult for me to evaluate this without seeing, hey, this is how much I'm paying for, you know, an 18 foot stick of ductile iron 10 inch pipe. This is how much I'm paying for the unions. This is how much concrete is in there that better helps to to evaluate a change order like this to say okay yeah we're we're seeing that this is this is going market value and these are how the numbers line out and so without that backup it's it's really difficult for me to to break that apart and, and give a straight answer saying yes you know this is what they're paying this is how much it would cost contractor a b and c and then this is what they're charging for labor well i tend to think based on what I know, <laughs> and clearly we keep learning more, but um, 
my thoughts are let's go ahead and, and get the storm drainage project done, particularly in light of the fact that there may be other options in the future for that water, water source to come in to service the hydrants at the airport if that day ever comes, that this isn't the only option to get there. Uh, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and do the project that we originally intended to do, which was the storm drainage, and get that issue off the table. Because it appears to me once that's done, it won't be a huge deal if, I mean, that then we're not messing with those people's water. Uh, if we do need to hook into where that new line is for them, um, at some point, have to upgrade that, we'll have to do that. But let's get, that's my opinion. So let's, let's have TDA stick to the original bid, just extend that timeline and do the original project. That's where I'm at. You want to then maybe rebid the water line in the spring? When we're able to? We, we could, but let's just get originally done what we said we would get done. I, I would agree with that, but I also think that we look at rebidding in the spring for that water line uh, and, and, and see the different options because this, you know, if, if we go this route, we're going to have to have the pump station, we're going to have to have, right. you know, all that other additional yeah. stuff versus just coming off the hill. I mean, Maybe that would buy a little time to explore some more options and get you know, the, whole, on that. the whole idea of looking at that <clears throat> three, let's call it 300 foot section was the fact that we had a trench open there anyway. That was the whole mm -hmm. reason we're even looking at it. And we're finding out that's much more complex than just replacing 300 foot of line. So um, I, I, I think that I, I definitely, when I was, scrolling this over that was that was where i would would have leaned is you know it, it doesn't hurt us to 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 ask for additional pricing but to keep the storm the storm water project as clean as possible um and then you know extend that out because we i think we got good pricing on that project um and then that that addresses the real issue that is the headache every time I see rain fall, I'm always worried about that area and that'll address that, that risk for us. And then if we utilize that time and we, we figure out and get a little more educated on the water system here in a few, I think probably about two weeks, we'll have the analysis from Mountain Cross on, on what they feel is the best option for us to, to expand the water out there at the airport. And then from there, we could then say, okay, if he still feels that coming off of the highways and the current supply line is the best, then we can continue and figure out how to do that. And and you know, not to not to muddy the waters, but then we might be able to then look at providing receiving pricing for that whole that whole project and then we'd have a better education on on what the magnitude of that's gonna be for the airport. And it it might play in our benefit to wait because Hopefully, the fire district will come to an agreement with the hospital at the end of this week awesome. regarding um, that five acres that, that they were going to get. So if, if that is the case, I think that's only going to bring the water line even closer Differently. to the airport. That being, if that were to come to duration, the six to 10 inch upgrade would not have been needed. Correct. So it would just be a redundant line. Yeah. Correct. Which that's kind of my take on. It. Let's just have Travis get on it and get this storm drainage. That was the original. Okay, so I I'll work with Don and we'll we'll issue like I said we'll follow the no no change order contract with the stipulations uh, that hey we need to get the procurement we need we don't sit on our hands just because we have more time now we need to get everything procured and in the yard and then we're extending this work to be done. And I'm assuming in the contract. Once that material is landed, he can bill us for that material. Correct. Yeah, there's a, there's okay. Things. Yeah. So he he can bill us for all progress. Yeah. Um, but um, and and it may need to say that we are the, currently then the owner of that material. You can't take it and use it on another project or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Just a, yeah. yeah. So, so I will I will touch base with him and okay. and work with Don on getting that draft bid with him. Yeah. Um, about the um, drop in the five acres, um, what 
So that's um, uh, there's a hoax. Private fiber runs runs right in line with this, and it's only a few inches deep. Uh, in the contract documents, basically, we will work with Travis when he's ready to install that section of line. We will disconnect that from hoax, allow him to run the line, and then we will lay it back over and and connect it back up. That's still necessary, even if we're just doing the storm drain. Yes, is it? It's just right. There's a there's a cross there where the six inch, the two inch gas, and the fiber all are right there, and we have enough room for the storm lines with the gas and the water, but the the uh, the fiber will have to lay it back and it. It's fiber to the Abbott property, though. Is what we were. Yeah, remember the conversation with Trevor that we don't have fiber to the Abbott property, but the drop box is right there or something. So we were going to see if you guys could then. Oh, and I, oh, so I told Travis, uh, I told, sorry, I told Trevor we could just, facilities could oh, just rent okay. a trencher okay. and, oh, okay. yeah, that's a, that's a no factor issue. Oh, okay. That's the easiest of my day. Yeah. <laughs> that's digging a hole and throwing some line in. Um, uh, the next thing was, um, so Jeremy McAllister uh, at the end of August gave me a call. They were doing the airport seal project. Um, maintenance project out at Rangeley Airport and he said hey Eric I got a unique problem um, we had a contractor offloading their their equipment and they damaged um, a taxiway out at the Rangeley Airport um, can you go take a look at it and so when I got out there on site I was heading there anyways when I got out there on site there's a section on a taxiway there on the the east side of the airport uh, there's no airport hangers around it there's just, it kind of extends out a couple, you know, about 100 feet, 150 feet past the last air, uh, airplane hangar that they uh, looked like they were offloading a skid loader or, or you know, a backhoe or something. And it left basically a trench down the center line of the, the asphalt where the tire embedded in the asphalt. Um, when I got out there, one of their big concerns and why they asked me was um, the asphalt around the damage area was actually pumping. So when you walked on it, you could feel it it moving. And I included some photos. Um, I went out there and and in my scientific method, I peeled up some asphalt and stuck my pocket knife in the dirt. And uh, I mean, it's it's really wet clay material. Um, I'm not sure when the taxi was, was put in place, but it clearly isn't a, a standard bedding for, for asphalt. It's probably something that a while back, you know, a long time ago, they just extended it out and graded it and, and called it good. Um, both my concern and, and TO, Jeremy McAllister, the engineer for TO's concern was the contractor is definitely liable for repairing this. However, given the situation, if they come in, they cut this and they patch it. One is we might end up with a bigger problem than we currently have. We, you know, we peel back that that bandaid and or uncover this, and then and then we got something that we're not prepared for financially to to fix. You know, it's like where do you stop kind of thing. And so Jeremy went back and met with the contractor and said, Hey, listen, if we don't require you to do the deduct, how much? How much or do the repair? How much of a deduct would you give us? And and Jeremy provided an email. It's one of the last pages um, that the contractor is willing to um, their their total contract value is nine thousand three hundred nineteen for the work the county is um, obligated to pay for that work out there because the taxiways don't fall under FAA funding. And so they're willing to give us a, a credit of $2,704 and a $2, um, deduct if they don't have to do their repair. And, and so one, of the, one option that we have as a county is we accept this deduct and then we would then have like a, a geotech engineer come out and do some boring out there, some cores out there to kind of figure out where does this problem end? You know, what's the parameters of it? And that would give us basic an idea to say, okay, when we choose to to fix this issue, this is the the size of this project. Um, of course, the other option is we say, 
we, we, we don't want to deduct you guys go fix what you damaged. And, you know, and we, we essentially hope that they're able to fix it without expanding the issue or creating a bigger issue. Um, I would lean towards the first option, just given the fact that, um, there's not any other airplane hangars in this section, so we're not causing any issue with traffic or safety. I did notice uh, there is an airplane, the closest airplane hangar to this this damaged area, which is probably another 50 feet away. Um, they're showing a little bit of the asphalt degrading and and kind of showing some settlement and stuff like that, and so there there probably be a pretty safe assumption that that part is included in this this other area that has probably some unsuitables under it. Um, however, it doesn't seem to be in a spot where it would impact the operations of the airport out there. So we would have some, some good time to kind of figure out where is this at on our priority list and what's the magnitude of, of the problem. So it's currently not impacting the, the operation of the airport. No, and, and we don't see it impacting any current future uh, any current plans at the airport right now is even bringing in and start boring that probably going to cost us way more than the 27 um well you know I, I did some i did some geotechnical work at columbine when i was doing the indoor arena and i think it came in at like it came in at between five and six thousand because they, they have to mob a, a drilling rig out there and and the only drilling rig that can do the cores is theirs, and they mow it from steamboat. It, that's the biggest cost is driving this old beat up truck out there and then and doing some core work. But I haven't I haven't searched around much since that project. There might be some cheaper options if we ask someone in Vernal or so we can just take the deduct and then in the future figure out how we want to. Yeah. Remember right. that's right. always going to be 100 percent county dollars. Just right. because it, right. it's taxiways. Yeah. yeah. I know we can't make a decision here. It would be to do what your, I think your first recommendation is, which, but not necessarily include that we have to go do this boring immediately. Um, we'll take their deduct and, and then take a bigger look at what's going on for our future. So, so, what we can do, and what I told uh, Jeremy is so the, the contractor was moving back in at the end of this month to do some of the final the final sill code out there, and so that's where the the timeline of is us giving him an answer. And so, what we can do is after this meeting, is I contact Jeremy and I say, "Hey, look, we're going to exercise the option of the deduct, and then next board meeting we have that as a formal uh, deduct option uh, for their contract, and Jeremy will get that drafted and, and taken care of, and then that way." Um, you know, it'll be closed out and done before they they have to move in again. Okay. And then we'll discuss during budget. I'll just make sure that's, in there. that's like a future capital yep. project. Yep. Right yep. Um, last thing is just a quick blurb. There's a contract on the board's agenda today. I, I have to head up the cathedral to finish them some work on the generator. Um, there's a contract from the board for Johnson Controls. Um, it's for doing our fire our inspections and testing on our fire systems throughout the county wide. Uh, this work wasn't sent out formal bid because it falls under the state procurement. Um, so this pricing is based off of the procurement at the state level. It's um, the best pricing that we can get. I've gone through numbers of options and local um, there's very few companies that can come in and inspect all our systems and test all our systems. And so this is, this is an annual cost that we have to incur to keep everything operational and, and I within compliance. Correct. Yep. Okay. Well, great. We well, better move on. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Anxious to get up here. <laughs> um, Good morning. Hi. How is everybody? So I'm excited to be here um, for for a few things. Um, 
one, I kind of wanted to give an update on how it was going. You know, Moffitt is providing assistance for the Child Welfare Department. And I know that, um, which was understandable, there was a lot of concerns on, was it really going to work? You know, sometimes when things is on paper, it's okay. But in actuality, when it's really rolled out, it's not as good as you think it's going to be. But so far, knocking on wood, we haven't had any uh, major things to happen that I'm aware of. I actually even invited the state to come down because one thing that I knew for sure was that I was, I'm a new dual director. I have a new assistant director. We have a new child welfare supervisor. I really wanted to make sure that we were looking at every angle. So I invited two leaders, our liaison and one of the leaders from the state to come down to take a look at the operations and how we were functioning and how we were doing. And what I had them do was just random pick client files to go through to see what was missing, see where we could improve. Um, that went well. There was nothing major. Um, some of the things that were noted was just due to having new staff. So that's just more of a training process. So overall, the process has, has gone well. Um, the on-call piece, we haven't had any major issues or problems. Uh, the school districts, they know how to contact us if needed. Again, I haven't heard anything major, and usually if something happens, uh, they blow up my phone. So I was relieved that, you know, that appeared to be going well. So what I would like to do, though, is get back to the, the, the deputy director position and some of our dual county positions and discuss those because I feel that both Moffitt and Rio were ready to move forward. Uh, but in order to do that, because I am aware of the budget and, and things that is happening, I think I need to do a little bit of re uh, reorganization on the Rio Blanco side. So my thought process, and you know I'm always thinking differently. So my thought process um, for dual counties is, um, have a dual county assistant director. Uh, we had already previously discussed within the process, had some initial contracts uh, created, but I would like to go ahead and finalize for the foster care slash kinship uh, specialist person, dual county, and also the family engagement position to have that dual county. And then also, um, I wanted to have a dual county adult protection worker and have those dual county positions. What I want to do away with, though, for the Rio Blanco side is, again, the deputy director will be a dual county. The child welfare supervisor position, I want to get rid of that position altogether. So you're like, okay, what is she thinking? Let me tell you how I got there. So what happened is on the child welfare side, Rio Blanco has currently right now two full-time child welfare certified workers, and we have one part-time um, case aid. When you have the dual county director, uh, the, the dual county assistant director, he is certified to provide supervision for the child welfare department. We're talking, in, I'll say two and a half employees. He can supervise two and a half employees on the Rio Blanco side as far as the child welfare position. Uh, the, we have a child welfare supervisor in Moffitt that is able to supervise the child welfare workers on that side. So it wouldn't really uh, be anything that would be just real strenuous because again, you're just talking about currently two and a half employees. So we'll do away with the child welfare supervisor, just have the assistant director who is certified on the adult protection side and on the child welfare side to provide that supervision for two and a half employees. And to be honest with you, right now, uh, Rio Blanco doesn't have a certified adult protection worker, but if we do the adult protection worker dual county, we have that covered. He's doing that now already. He's providing those services right now already on the adult protection side. There is on the Rio Blanco side one more full-time uh, child welfare worker. 
that's the position that we change into a dual county. So again, I'm not creating new positions without money that's not already there. I'm working within all of the frameworks of what we already have. Um, but the other thing that I think would be really beneficial is the case aid that we have because we're looking at doing dual county. And one of the other things that I want to do in, in moving both counties forward, Moffitt is already a, a differential response county. 80% um, of the counties um, are Department of Human Services or a differential response. And what that basically means is when we go out and we work with families, is we respond differently. We focus more on how can we keep the families together? What more can we do? It's just a different way of practice. I wanna move Rio Blanco to that, to that piece. We had started that piece before I came, the process was already started. So, and I checked and uh, I checked with the state to kind of see where we were at. And the only thing was missing really was the application. So again, in moving that way, that's going to be able to create some more options for the case A and move the case A position from a part-time person to a full-time person, which I think we'll be able to do because we'll be saving on one, the child welfare, uh, the child welfare position that we cut in half because we are going to share that expense with Moffitt. We are doing the dual county assistant director. You're saving on that end. We're eliminating the child welfare supervisor. In actuality, we still have the same number of people in place. And I'm going through, so as of Friday, <laughs> I will be certified on the child welfare side. Mm -hmm. So again, we're still looking the same as far as the number of people, as far as the number of certifications by the end of the year. So by Friday, I can submit my request to be certified where I can be thrown in and cover the on-call piece and all of that great stuff. By the end of the year, I will be certified on the child welfare side, so I can uh, rotate in if I need supervision. But again, I think um, doing some dual counties, the family engagement that was already positions that we had discussed, uh, that we had, that we were cutting in half anyway to to, accommod to accommodate all of those. Uh, move Forward, uh, would allow us to go ahead and for me to fill out the application for us to um, to be more in, in streamline with the rest of the, the Department of Human Services as far as a practice of differential response. Again, I think when you think about it, uh, that's the mission of what we want to do. Are we really working to make sure that we maintain and keep our families together? Are we building those relationships and collaborations with our partners in the community? in order to make some of those happen. Uh, the foster care, that's just, especially in the Rio Blanco area, that's just bubbling and waiting to, to grow. A couple of weeks ago, we got the contractor in, uh, set in place for her to provide the home study piece. So we're, we're moving forward, although a lot of parts are moving and happening at one time, we're making some progress, but I'm really ready to uh, get these contracts uh, in place move the Department of Human Services forward and maintaining our budget and saving. And I also believe, and this is something, I don't know what the numbers or anything would look like. I'm not that great with numbers, but in speaking with Janae, when I had first mentioned this to her months ago, sort of that this is my idea, uh, there's also a possibility that we could give uh, pay raises to the staff at DHS. So, so I think who's ever on the phone, please mute your phone. So I think that this would be a doable option. I think um, I did share this idea because, again, I am new and and learning the ins and the out. I did share this with the state as far as, you know, what do you think uh, you have, you know, provide me with your feedback. And they actually thought it was a great idea. They thought it was pretty innovative. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. You have any questions that you want to ask me? Who, uh, who are the child welfare employees for Rio Blanco County? We have Jesse Yarbrough. He is housed here out of Meeker. And then we have Leah Shields. And Leah became certified like 
August. Yeah, about a month ago. Um, and she is actually in the Rangeley office. Case worker? Case aid. Uh, her name is Dawn, and she's housed here in, I can't remember Dawn's last name off the top of my head, but Dawn is housed here out of uh, the Meeker office. So under under this, would you anticipate any jobs being lost in Rio Blanco County? No. Okay. Um, so I do have an issue with the, the dual deputy um, director. I mean, if... if for me to support that, mm -hmm. I feel like we're putting all of our eggs in one basket up in Moffitt. And for me to support that, I would like that dual deputy director to, to live in, in Rio Blanco County, not necessarily Meeker or Rangeley, but in the county and have a better presence in, in our offices here. And, and talking with a lot of that staff, they feel like um, they, they don't have the, the communication and the supervision that that they would like to see and in order to not be for me not to feel like we're putting all of our eggs in one basket if we had that dual deputy director in Rio Blanco County I would feel a lot better about that um, I um, do I do want to share that I live in Rio Blanco yeah, County part of where I, was going. Where I, I just I literally just moved to Rangeley so I live in Rangeley now I have been there maybe two weeks, so it's new. It's okay. relatively new. So they do have the director that lives in Rio, but again, it's just been a couple of weeks. So do you do you operate more out of that office then? Not necessarily. It because here's here's the deal: is for me, I'm sixty percent Moffitt and forty percent Rio Blanco, and I believe in honoring the contract as much as possible. So what I try to do is I look at my schedule and figure out where I need to be. It's based on what's happening in each county and what's going on in each county. So the last two weeks, I haven't necessarily spent more time in Rio Blanco County, but that's because I've been working with trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to make this happen. I've been over here in Meeker. I've been in Craig. Uh, I was in Rangeley yesterday. I'll, I'll be in Rangeley like two days this week. So I literally, it's relatively new, but I don't think that, um, I don't think it is a challenge to spend more time, but again, I am still a 60%. And, and to be honest with you, I think one of the things, and Janae can correct me if I'm wrong, when it comes to the assistant directors and the other positions, it's going to be more of a hourly base as a, as a percentage thing. I think the director was the only position that we were able to divide up on a percentage basis, whereas the other positions were based on more of a hourly position. So, for existence, the family engagement and the kinship, the position that was split in half was just a 32-hour position. So, it's 16 for family engagement for Rio Blanco, and 16, 16 hours for Rio Blanco, and then 16 uh, on the kinship side for Rio Blanco, and then the other would be Moffitt. But that's just because how, I don't, am I making sense? You get what I'm saying? Okay. So that if, if we need that service, Rio Blanco County pays for it, or we just pay right. for it regardless? No. So we will only be paying for the hours that are worked for Rio Blanco in these other positions. So who's going to make up the difference if there's not enough hours needed from where Blanco Moffat would pick up mm -hmm. whatever's left yeah. on the tab? Yeah. Yeah. So when when they um, when I believe when Barb and Michelle were still here, that was the discussion that you mm -hmm. had with them: is how many hours do you need for family engagement? How many hours do you need for foster care? Mm -hmm. And then that was kind of split between what um, Tia had that conversation with. Um, Barbara Michelle, and then she had the conversation with Moffat to see, you know, we're kind of going out on a limb here and saying this is what we believe. Right. It could be, you know, Rio Blanco one week needs 40, and then it's Moffat the rest of the time. I mean, it just kind of, it'll just depend. And, you know, it's one, it, it's one of those that, because it's new, we don't have, this is the thing I had shared um, 
I had shared earlier uh, with with some of the leaders is that because it's new, we don't have a baseline to go with. So we're going to be creating it. So in having the contract, one of the things is it's going to have to be reviewed on a continuous basis because we may get to a point where, you know what, Moffitt may need more and Rio Blanco may need less or Rio Blanco may need more and we may need to look at doing the positions differently. But we don't have a baseline yet established in order to to make this work. And you had mentioned that the staff had shared with you about, uh, as far as the lead, uh, as far as concerned about the leadership and being available, um, you know, I haven't had those communications. They haven't shared those. Um, they haven't shared those communications with me. And I'll definitely go back and and we'll have you know, ask point blank directly, um, because I like to believe that we are accessible. Um, You know, I send out, although everyone has access to calendars, you know, I send out weekly where I'm at. Like, so yesterday I had said I was going to be in Craig and I wound up being in Rangeley. So I send out, you know, I'm in Rangeley. I was having trouble out of my cell phone. Like, look, I'm having trouble out of my cell phone. So I try to go above and beyond to make sure as far as accessibility. And it's, it's not so much accessibility. I think it's the present is what they want. Like I, the, the on-site. I can, I can understand that. Yeah. I, I can understand that because it does look different. Um, that, that I just don't want them to tie that to if we're not there, it doesn't mean you're not supported because we're not going to be able to. The, the way things are, we're not going to be able to be there. Uh, especially doing the dual counting method, we're not going to be able to be there every day, all day. But that doesn't mean that you're still not supported um, in whatever may be happening within the office. So I can understand that. And I, I would just add, I do see that differently than Ty. I think that we hired a department head. I'm a big fan of collaborating services with neighboring counties in light of where everybody's budgets go. I think it's absolutely required. This is just a big step in that way, and I appreciate you really jumping in there and looking at how we can restructure to better serve both camps. I think we got to be really careful to not make this a Rio Blanco versus Moffitt issue. Otherwise, that's doomed for failure. Yeah, no, and, and I agree. I, let me, I let me finish. And I also believe that as commissioners, our role is to work with our department heads and not get down into the weeds with their staff. And that's that's where I'm at. So I do see it there. Yeah, no, I, and I, I'm all in favor of collaborating and collaborating services and, and letting the department heads do what they want. But I also want to make sure Real Blanco County is protected if something does go sideways. Well, and I, I have confidence. Um, yeah, I, mean, I do we've, too, but we've been here. Happens. Since I've been here, I'm seeing DHS look better quite frankly in the direction they're going than i've seen before i'll just leave it at that so anyway clearly we see it a little bit <laughs> well and that, that's normal yeah that is what we can do is uh, uh work with the and i and secretary and, and uh, uh could all work together and try to develop these contracts for for approval uh, by the board or, or rejection by the board mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And I want to add one of the other things that I'm doing is really uh, is having the communication with both counties that times are changing and we're going to start to look differently and that's okay. So some of the things that I've started to do, like like I actually start this month, um, you know, I'll do an email blast and I do an email blast to both counties sharing information Um, instead of having two separate county uh, all county staff meetings, we're going to combine. And what will happen is I'll change locations each month for the staff meeting, but uh, we'll have all, all of us will get together. So we needed to create more of 
depending and relying on one another, more of a collaborative, uh, more of a collaborative effort in order to, um, I think that will help to ease like this county versus that county. You know, one of the reasons why I had looked at Rio Blanco County and living in Rio Blanco County was simply because um, I didn't want the parents to be that I favored one because I spent more time, although that's what the contract calls for. So I'm like, if I'm living there, <laughs> that's my home, uh, that that gives a different feel and a different appearance. I was very mindful and, and, and intentional of, of that. And actually, I like being able to walk everywhere and <laughs> and all of that great stuff. The dogs have adjusted uh, well to, uh, to be in there and everything. So, uh, again, I am working to make it more of a collaborative effort, even between the employees. When the state had came in, I had the child welfare workers from Rio Blanco come up to Moffitt, and we had there was a, a training that I had the state do, and we talked about safety. We talked about engagement. Um, we talked, you know, providing trainings that were um, going to help both counties to do better and, and to perform better. So I am working to to mesh more of of that together. Um, the other thing is, if we do these dual counties, uh, to be honest with you, I I feel pretty confident, and I've asked uh, I've asked the workers uh, in Rio, I've asked the workers in Moffitt, we're ready to come out from under the contract as far as Moffitt needing to provide that support. Uh, so we could do these dual contracts, and so it wouldn't be those added expenses. We can, we, although the contract originally was set for 90 days, we could actually give like a 30-day notice, and hopefully within that 30 days get these other contracts uh, in place. But we could pull out and still, uh, the on-call schedule would change some because it wouldn't be Moffitt, but we could uh, pull back off of that and just have this in place. And again, that'll go back to to saving funds as well. Uh, just so I, I just I'm jotting this down, so I want to make sure I'm all right for budget um, discussion. So, dual county foster care, dual county family engagement. Then, of course, the APS we talked about, mm -hmm. the assistant director, the case aid position that we have as half time in Rio. We've moved that to full time yes. for Rio, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, I think you mentioned it, but I. I'm sorry, I didn't get that written down. On the caseworker that we still have open in Rio, is that going to say? What do we want? No, to the, the caseworker position that we have open in Rio, we're changing that. We're actually going to cut it in, cut it in half, and it'll be actually a lower rate of pay because it's a, it's going to. Uh, well, no, that's going to change over to the dual county. That's where we're going to get the funds for the dual county APS. Does that make sense? Okay. So in Rio, we're just going to have the two full-time caseworkers, and that's it. You'll have the two full-time caseworkers, and then you'll have a dual county APS worker. Okay, and then the full-time case. Day. And a so full-time case. Day I can go people. ahead and take out that third child welfare mm -hmm. caseworker, and then I'll it, take it, out the director, of course, and the supervisor. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Do we have enough APS in both counties to keep a full-time APS worker? So, of course, Moffitt has a, no. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, of course, Moffitt's numbers are larger as far, because it's a bigger county, is, is larger than Rio Blanco's. How many would you say, he knows the numbers better than I do, how many adult protection cases would you say Rio Blanco have right now? Uh, Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Never has been much. Right. For APS. That's kind of what I was thinking. That we have a pretty low. We need an APS certified yes. worker. I mean, mm -hmm. when, when, just when we get them, we need it. You know. Mm -hmm. And and like I said, it actually because of the contract, um, the, the contract that we have in place now, the worker that would be doing that, that's what he's actually doing right now. Is we have him doing both. Uh, we have him doing both counties. So. And again, because it's we're based on hours, it shouldn't cost um, it shouldn't cost a arm and a leg because it would be based on hours. And and you know, of course, there are times when it may be higher, you know, than than at others. But you try to certify that worker at household child welfare or just 
he is he has completed um so what happens is you go he's gone through the child welfare training and then at the end there's two one is assimilation and one is a peer review those are the only two pieces that are left so he he will do that and we're also for the child welfare workers here they're going to also take the um, they're also going to work on the adult protection side as well um, it was just Le- Leah just finished hers last month and then Jesse he just got his at the beginning of the year so probably if if we don't look at late fall by definitely by after the first of the year making sure they get in the adult protection training as well so so what I happen is uh, it will be four it will be the two certified workers here and then you have the assistant director and then you have myself just like it had been before and we would just rotate any other questions and thank you so much for that no problem. <laughs> thank you i appreciate it any other questions all right thank you to you very much mm-hmm. all right Harley Thompson with an update on uh, sporting survey results. All right, so I'm going to go over the results from our survey that we did for the four day work week. We did put it out on Facebook. We had access on our website. There was a large banner on there. We did a news update, which sent emails to our subscribers on our website, did ads in the newspaper two times, and then had flyers at both towns, grocery stores, and post offices. And then we had paper copies available here at the courthouse and at DHS in Rangeley for people to do paper copies if they wished. We received 263 surveys back. I'm gonna go over some of the demographics for people on the phone and YouTube because they don't have the sheet in front of them. But so 263 back for age demographics, 2.3 were under 20, 21 to 31, 8.4, 31 to 40 was 28.6, 41 to 50, 18.3%. 51 to 60, 22.9, 61 to 70 was 16%, and then over 70 was 3.4% of the responses. 80.9% came from Meeker, and 16.8 came from Rangeley. 2.3 registered as other. The preferred method of use for county services, like in your vehicle renewed, stuff like that, 71% reported that they preferred in person or used it in person with 18.3 online and 10.7 by mail. We also did ask if they were business owners or managers. 40.1% reported that they were business owners or managers and then 59.9 said no. On the back is the actual question of their opinion on the four day work week. The question was asked if Rio Blanco County went to a compressed work week Would this have a positive impact, negative impact, or no change? 33.1 reported a positive impact, 40.7 was negative, and then 26.2 was no change. Then I took the business owners only and took their results to the same question. And 31.4 reported a positive, 53.3 negative, 15.2 15.2 was no change. And then I also took the ones who preferred to access our services in person, did the same on their opinion. 25.3 reported positive, 52.2 negative, 22.6 no change was the result from our survey. Um, in my conversations with people, the one thing that was repeated over and over again was it wasn't so much about the number of days. It was consistent hours across the board was their frustration. Any questions about? I'll just comment. My, and I gave Carly a heads up. 
I my <laughs> phone lit up on this one, and part of it was they didn't they struggled with accessing the website to comment was a piece of it, and I think the message from what I heard that did not get out there was that this is not a cost saving measure. Every, a lot of people that reached out to me assumed this was about cutting costs, mm -hmm. and it's not. And I still go back to, I think, to get a real number that's valid for us to make an assessment, we do need to stuff a mailbox. I think we got to go through that because I don't think 200 some people is really enough on a county that has 3,000 voters typically to vote um, to draw any major conclusion. And I just, that's just my opinion. I I think if you stuff mailboxes, you're going to find a lot of them in the trash can. Well, but at least I'll have the opportunity to comment. I, I mean, it was a, I think they had the opportunity. It was in the newspaper. Realize the newspaper only hits 500 people or residences, I should say. But they also hung it up um, at the post office and yeah. grocery store. So that hits a lot more. On Facebook alone, we reached, it came across people's feed at least 4,000 times, 4,122 times. Okay. On their feed, as many times, I went through and calculated how many people it reached based on the number of times I posted it. So I don't know if that. It would be pretty expensive to print this. Right? It was going to be at least $1,200 to print it. Yeah. This is a big decision. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Yeah. I, that's just my opinion. I, I'm not totally opposed to the 48 week, but I think we really need to get a legitimate reaction from our community. I, I really got my ear bent from some of the businesses that say we do a lot of business on Friday. And I'm talking the, the banks, um, auto dealerships, et cetera, that they feel this would really negatively impact them. So, um, and they just weren't voted the survey, but yet they are a big part of the revenue that comes into the clerk's office. So, so I think we we recognize first of all, they need to know this is not a cost saving measure, like everybody thought it was. And the survey never said that. That's one of my biggest issues. I I tried to be clear in our discussion about it, but it needed to say that. I I had quite a few conversations, and nobody. Uh, I, I guess there was one guy that thought that it might have been a cost saving measure, but that never just so never that. came up. But there, most of my conversations were they did not want it. They wanted us to stay open five days a week. So I think I think it got out there. I think the message was out there. But to what extent, I don't know. And I don't know if spending twelve hundred bucks if that's going to reach any more than the two hundred and sixty three. And it wasn't really definitive one way or the other. I mean, it was pretty close on the back, but you can see it's close to about a third each. A little bit different. I mean, little variation, but of the three choices, it was kind of a mixed bag. I see it as a pretty major decision because the courthouse is heard here to serve the public, not the other way around. And, uh, I'm, I'd like to get more input than just 200 people personally uh, before we make a change. That's my personal. Uh, it's fine. It's, I, I'm not opposed to getting more people's opinion, but I don't think we're going to really get a true snapshot of everybody by sending out a mailer. But, I mean, we can try it. I just don't know. See, I walked away from season. our Rangeley meeting thinking that's what we're going to do. I received, I surveyed all three commissioners. I know, but that, you said, Carly, you need to share with us. Get back and say, here's what I found. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm a coordinator. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. but, um, I wish Jeff was. Jeff, are you not on the phone? I understood he would be, but. Um, I think I think we should at least have a third commissioner opinion here on this now um, before we make mm -hmm. a decision on it. And we're just in a workshop, but thank you for presenting 
you know, what you found. So, yeah. Yeah, good job. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on. We did end up with a half hour. Uh, <laughs> We've got no, we'll use that good. good. We can have a little. At least I don't anticipate. Uh, we'll move on to Don Stearman with the ERB Health District resolution. Right. We received a letter from uh, the attorneys for the uh, uh, Eastern Hill Lakewood County uh, Health Services District, which is a pioneer medical center. Um, they want to amend their resolution and, and their, their bylaws to go from seven members to five members. Uh, the requirements under the, uh, the hospital special district require five members. There's a procedure from going from five to seven, but not necessarily a true procedure to go back. What they're, they're, they're wanting to do, and the, their justification for it is they're having a difficult time filling that many members on, on the board. So they want to go back to the five, or well, actually not go back, they've never been five. It started with seven when they came back. So what they, they, they propose to do, and I think this is probably a few what they should do if that's you know what they need to do is, is they, they submitted it to, to us because we approved the service plan for the special district uh, in the first place. So we need to make a decision if we think going from seven directors to five directors is a substantial or material modification from the, the approved service plan that we approved from the district this morning. Um, if we do, then we file an objection within 45 days of receipt of the letter. And then if, if not, we can either tell them we don't have an objection or we can let the time elapse. And then they could petition the district court and ask the judge to approve that change to their the bylaws the, the same way that they did originally when they, they set their district. Um, I don't know if, if you guys would consider that a material modification of their uh, bylaws or not, but that's the rationale for it. I think it's if their board deems that they only need five, then I'm okay with that. I am too. I got no issues. I, I think especially since they're having a hard time. I mean, if they're trying to get people out, but it sounds like they're just having a hard time filling those positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, if that's what they want to do, I kind of see them as independent from us. And I'm surprised that it does have to, that we have any action in it at all, but I don't have a problem. Do uh, you want me to respond to them that we've talked about it and there's no objection from the board? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Do that. Okay, very good. Um, so that, concludes our work session. Is there any questions or comments before we end the work session? Hi, Scott, are you back there? And I don't, why don't you introduce yourself so that people that I have to. Um, Scott Marsh, and I just had a couple of different things. I didn't know if this work session is where or not, but um, with the county going through so many major changes, like what you were just talking about with Tia, um, what about change management class? Something along those lines. Is I know a lot of people are worried about the security of their job and different things like that. And if you were to take that group of people between Moffat and Rio Blanco County and throw in some commissioners and do a change management class and assure people of different things in the class, I think that could be extremely beneficial to the county. Um, like I say, there's several major changes going on in the county and reassurance, reassurance from you guys plus doing a change management class might not be a horrible thing. Sounds good to me. I got no time. And I like the idea. I talked to Ty, but that is one thing that um, like Garfield does is they do have a monthly meeting with the department heads. Um, some of that could come in handy. I mean, sometimes it could be a little bit of a waste, but I do believe there's times where it could come in handy. Like um, Eric, when he was talking about core drilling, well, I just did that last month on a bridge in Rangeley. And if we would have known, we could have probably got together and helped and saved mobilization and things like that. So just a few things like that, that might help and actually might strengthen your team that you have with 
the department heads that you currently have? That's my own opinion. No, I think I like the idea. I have yeah. to dismiss myself. Because I think there is. <laughs> <laughs> and just for those on the phone, Scott is the Roden Bridge director that is speaking. So he's speaking from a point of, of kind of knowing what's going on. Multiple places, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's why I didn't say that. But. No, I think it's a good idea. Couldn't hurt. Absolutely. So, well, something to look at is all into what it takes to do that. So I think that's a great idea. Perfect. Yeah. Any other questions for the work session? Hi, this is Lucas Turner from the Herald Tide. I have a comment. Um, so I just wanted to correct the record real quick based on our circulation numbers. Um, our standard circulation estimates are 2,500 based on standard estimates for estimating circulation for newspapers. Our page views on our website are between 25 and 30,000 per month, mm -hmm. and our monthly Facebook reach is between 10 and 15,000 per month. So just wanted to note that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else? All right, we're gonna take a break. Uh, we'll conclude our work session and we will convene our commissioner meeting at 11 a.m. Thank you. That was good. <laughs> yeah, it's a break I kinda need right now. That age thing. I was, uh, oh, it was, that was pretty cool. Sorry. I know the correct rules. Yeah, I'm in the major doghouse. When you get a chat.